Julie C. Day with Essential Dreams Press, and today I'll be interviewing Theodora Goss. Theodora Goss was born in Hungary and spent her childhood in various European countries before her family moved to the United States, where she completed a PhD in English literature. She is the world fantasy, locus, and methopic award-winning author of the short story and poetry collections In the Forest of Forgetting, Songs for Ophelia, and Snow White Learns Witchcraft, as well as the novella The Thorn and the Blossom, debut novel The Strange Case of the Alchemist's Daughter, and the sequels European Travel for the Monstrous Gentlewoman and the Sinister Mystery of the Mesmerizing Girl. She's been a finalist for the Nebula, Bob Crawford, and Shirley Jackson Awards, as well as on the Tiptree Award honor list. Her work has been translated into 15 languages. She teaches literature and writing at Boston University. All right, welcome, Dora. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Julie. Thank you so much for having me here. I am so thrilled. I've known you in the background, just no, off to the, we both live in the same state, it's unavoidable, unavoidable. but your work and how it ties to Tanith Lee, um, something we've never gotten to talk about. We and, haven't, um, I wonder why. There's, there's always so much to talk about, you know. It's true, and then, you know, it, it's sort of part of this secret Tanith, I don't know, cabal in a way in which you'd never know who has been touched by her and who hasn't. And for those who haven't, it doesn't, she just doesn't come up as much as I think she should. Um, so we're so excited that you're going to be a part of our anthology, a uh, storyteller, a uh, Tanith Lee tribute anthology. But I wanted to talk to you today about your writing, your connection to her work, and just about anything else you'd like to talk about. I'm going to so start with a Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. No, you, you, I know you're going to ask me a question and I was already thinking about how to answer it. So you actually ask the question, Julie, so that people know what the question is. <laughs> okay, fair enough. All right. What impact has Tanith Lee had on you as a writer? Okay. So what I want to do is I want to take you back to the days when they were malls. Uh, so there were malls. Do you remember <laughs> malls? And then we used to go to the malls. And do you remember when there were bookstores in malls? Do and there I was ever. no internet. No internet and no big Barnes and Noble. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this was before Barnes and Noble. And there were, there were um, still chain bookstores because there were chain bookstores in the mall. And just like nowadays, there were the, there were different sections. Uh, and I was a teenager. This was, um, I was growing up, I was a teenager in Loudoun County, Virginia. And so our local mall was called the White Flint Mall. And uh, in there they had a bookstore and sure enough, the bookstore had a fantasy and science fiction section. And I would go there uh, as often as possible because you know there was no internet. What were you gonna do? You were gonna hang out at the mall. So we went and hung out at the mall um, and we always went to see what had just been published and what was in the science fiction and fantasy section. And there were four writers that I always looked for. So they? they were Ursula Gwynn, Anne McCaffrey, cause dragon riders, of course. Yes. Um, Patricia McKillop and Tanith Lee. And those four women writers, it, actually in my most recent book, I think that the, um, what is that thing called at the beginning where you're like, this book is for so-and-so. I, I, the dedication? I'm pretty sure I have to look, but I'm pretty sure that I made it to them because without those four writers, I wouldn't be the writer that I am now. And there were other writers mm -hmm. that influenced me, but right then when I was a teenager, right when I was starting to write, those were the four writers. And I got different things from each of them. And I have to tell you one more thing. Mm -hmm. um, I can't find it. I was looking for it, but um, I was writing Tanith Lee fan poetry oh. based on some of her characters as a teenager. And I still have that. I still have those handwritten oh. poems somewhere, but oh, I don't know where. That's amazing. You need yeah. to find them. I don't, I, you don't need to publish them, but if I ever see it, 
gosh. Oh, really no. I, no. They, you don't I would love to, to see them. them. <laughs> no, no. I was, what, 17? Oh, mm. but it's so sweet. It's like there's actually somewhere on the internet is a Tanith Lee story she wrote when she was about seven That's uh, that was released out into the world. And it's uh -huh. like, even though she's a small child, you can still see her personality yeah. in that. And I bet with your poem, that would be the same thing, you know? I think that's true. I think you can see the writer that I eventually became right in that little yeah. poem and right in the influence that I was getting from her. I actually have to say that I find it interesting that you're able to take, you know, science fiction and fantasy. And I, am I right in thinking that you read short fiction as much as novels? Um, I did actually, which I think is unusual probably. Um, but I did read a lot of short fiction and there's a particular book of hers um, that was super influential. I, you might even guess which one it is. <laughs> I'm not going to guess. I'm going to have you tell me. Okay. Um, it was called, I actually looked up the title because um, I, I was trying to remember exactly what the wording was, but it's, um, I wrote it down here. Hang on. I have very- Is it The Sisters Grimmer? Of course it was. Retta's Because blood, that's on my bookshelf. The Sisters Grimmer. Huh? I own that book still. I kept it. I'm sure you do. Of course you do. <laughs> and um, it's interesting because those of us who were influenced by fairy tale retellings, a lot of people say, oh, I was so influenced by Angela Carter. I don't know about you, but I didn't discover Angela Carter until much later. I mean, Angela Carter yes. was someone that I actually read maybe in college and maybe even mm -hmm. after college because uh, her stuff was not necessarily available in the local bookstore, but Tanith Lee's Tales from the Sisters Grimmer was absolutely available. And so um, my, my own impulse to retell fairy tales and the way that I think about fairy tales and fairy tale retellings came from two sources. One was Tanith Lee and the other was the Ellen Datlow, Terry Winling uh, fairy tale retelling series, which Publish some of Tanith Lee's short books. Books. Yeah. So yeah. So, oh, so that true. was the way that I got it. It wasn't necessarily from what was happening in the UK. This is uh in terms of um some of the other stuff that was going on. I mean, uh Tanith Lee was a British writer and her stuff was coming yep. over here, but that that was the stuff that was coming to the US, if that makes sense. That was it makes complete here. sense because actually um, I got all my Tanith Lee, if not, or most of it, not all of it, most of it through, <laughs> I was also into science fiction and fantasy as a teen. And I was a member of the science fiction book club and I would get the catalog. Oh. That's what I did because um, I lived in Southern Indiana. And at that time in a small town in Southern Indiana, I'm, I'm from the UK, but when I was younger. Um, there weren't too many bookstores and they certainly weren't carrying much in the way of fantasy and science fiction. So for me to find it in the middle of the country at that time, um, that was sort of my way. And also there wasn't a mall where I lived. There wasn't there was, a mall. You didn't have a mall? <laughs> no. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> so it was like, that was great. But it, I ended up with the same books. And honestly, maybe there's a whole bunch of us, Anne McCaffrey and the Dragon Riders of Fern. Yeah, that, that yeah. was my that was my career goal. In I think it was even elementary school, elementary school and middle school. I was like dragon rider. I want to be a dragon rider, either a dragon rider or a writer. So I wanted to be an astronaut or a writer. Those were my two. <laughs> Those are good too. <laughs> um, okay. So we've talked a little bit about books that stood out for you when you were younger. Yeah. Um, did you continue to read her um, or read other types of her fiction later on when you were an adult? And if so, which of those books stood out for you? The and ones that really stood out for me and and um, were very influential were the Flat Earth series. And I kept reading them as they were coming out. Uh, I read some of her other books, but the the ones I kept going back to as time went on, were actually her short stories, her fairy tale stories, or stories about werewolves. And actually, it was because um, 
I was teaching college courses on fairy tales. And so I would give them to my students. Um, so Beauty and the Beast stories, um, stories about girls who turn into wolves that were kind of playing with things like the Little Red Riding Hood tropes. Um, and, and I read uh, some of her other books, but the, the ones that were most important to me were um, sort of darkly romantic. And I, I wrote down in my notes, dark romanticism, because I think that that was yeah. something, that was one of the reasons that she was important. It was one of the things that you were getting from her that you weren't necessarily getting from some of the other writers. And I was thinking of her mm -hmm. as bringing forward in a different way, um, uh, some of the, the things that were coming from Lord Dunsany. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. You, could you, for those who don't know who Lord Dunsany is, could you just expand on that a little bit? Yeah, he was an Irish writer. And um, it, it's interesting because we think of fantasy and science, sorry, not, not science fiction now, put science fiction to the side, mm -hmm. but we think of fantasy as sort of um, becoming really, really important with The Lord of the Rings. Uh, with Tolkien, and that's true in that it became a genre that had its own space in the bookstore, partly because, or or maybe largely because of Tolkien's influence, uh, because a lot of people began to imitate Tolkien, but Tolkien was also coming from somewhere, and there's this whole history of British fantasy that is there before Tolkien, um, and some of it especially the really the, the British side of it is is very much um, well not all of it it <laughs> sorry I, I'm thinking now with academic brain where you're always qualifying yourself but I'm thinking of someone like George MacDonald so his okay. most famous books are um, for children there was a lot of British fantasy for children there were um fairy tales for children. There were uh, writers like E. Nesbitt. So there, there was this, this sort of well-established tradition of fairy tales and fantasy for kids. Lord Dunsany was Irish. He was mm -hmm. Anglo-Irish. And so he writes fantastical things and they're not for kids. He's writing them for adults and they're, um, oh my gosh, how do you even describe them? Um, he's, he's dipping into kind of Irish, um, mythology and fairy lore. Uh, everything has this really magical feel to it. It can also be very dark. Um, and, uh, um, he is, I think this really important figure that is often kind of overshadowed by Tolkien because then Tolkien comes along and becomes so popular and everyone thinks well let's the the roots I'll of be him, honest let's go back I haven't to Tolkien. read Lord Dunsany but I would guess that for me I would have that would have appealed to me a lot more than Tolkien did you know yeah. like I'm okay. sorry to put Lord Dunsany on your reading list um I yeah. will tell you that um in her book The Language of the Night Ursula Gwynn writes that she came too late for Tolkien. She was very much influenced by Dunsany because she found his book in her father's bookshelf. And so he's a direct influence on Le Guin, but I can also see the stuff that he's doing coming through in Tanith Lee, especially the sort of darker and more fairy-ish side of it because Le Guin, she sort of goes in a different direction, right? Stylistically, she's very different from Kenneth Lee. And yet, I I, I at least would say that I see this influence well, in both of them. To bring it back to Kenneth just for a second, I would say that in the way that you say this about Dunsany, it's true of Kenneth too. It's that um, there's a broad array of styles that are influenced by her, even though she yeah. is distinctly herself. I mean, I, I think that's sort of the beauty of one generation of, or a, one generation of authors influencing the next is that it's not linear. It's, it's an explosion. 
you know, or or better than an explosion, because that sounds kind of, well, it is kind of chaotic. It's yeah. like a, a, a um, unfurling of a garden, I suppose. But it's just lovely. It's, it's yeah. so good to see. It's like if if you have, it's like a yarn explosion because you've got <laughs> all it. these threads going in different directions. And in terms of writers who are influenced by Tanit Lee, you have like, you have me, you have C.S.C. E. Cooney, um, you have- You've got Chana Mieville is one too. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's, you look at his stuff and you're like, I can kind of see it, but oh my gosh, he's really different from someone like Claire Cooney. So, yeah. you know, and and um, Terry Winling, of course. Yes, or um, um, there's on the science fiction side, uh, Martha Wells has stated uh -huh. that she's deeply influenced. And I would say again, that's a different, completely different style of writing, you know? Well, part of it is, is and I'm sure that you've already thought of this too, that Tanith Lee did so many different things, which I think is one of the reasons that um, it's in some ways, uh, how do I say it? Um, it? It's, she hasn't had that moment where people are like, oh, we know what she's doing. We're getting exactly what we want from her. She's easy to categorize. Right. Um, and, and that creates problems for writers, right? Because publishers are like, I don't know what you're going to do next. So. And I, I think it also, I think it was um, the other part of it is honestly that I, there's more, I think there's more space now for people to move a little bit than there was then, you know, yeah. even though it's not unfettered movement wherever you want to go I think you can do you know interstitial or tying different kinds of of genres together no one blinks an eye you know and yeah. then when when she was doing it, I, it, it at least for me I I didn't know it as a teenager I wasn't analyzing it I was just enthralled by it you know yeah. like it's it's it felt for or organically real than sticking with a specific because it, it was like you were being story was ruled by the author's imagination rather than the yeah. parameters of a specific subgenre and know. her imagination kind of went everywhere I was teaching a story of hers once I don't remember the name now but it was it starts as a beauty and the beast story and then you realize that it's a science fiction story and so yeah. it just she she was sort of crossed those boundaries very easily yeah i i had one of my favorites of hers it's not considered like a top 10 tanith lee but it's the electric forest and it was because it felt like one kind of story and then which was a very dark erotic um psychological story and then in the end it, it turns out it was actually a, a book ended it science fiction story that was the characters weren't at all who you thought they were and you land in a different place than you expect, but you had that very Tanith, as you call it, um, dark romanticism mm -hmm. mixed in with science fiction. And it, it sort of, it worked for me, absolutely, but it was not normal. That, that has to go on my reading list. I don't think I've read it, um, but, but it, it's an interesting observation because you look at, oh, well, you can't you can't categorically say it of someone like Le Guin, but it it might be a little bit easier to say she mixed it up to a little bit. But um, there are certain things that are pretty clearly science fiction and certain things mm -hmm. that are pretty clearly fantasy. But she mixes it up too. But she kind of does it in a different way. And Anne McCaffrey too, you read the Pern series and then you're like, oh, it's science fiction. I didn't know it was science fiction. So now I'm completely revising what I just said because now it seems to me, I don't know if this is fair to say, but the um, those three writers, those women writers were constantly crossing boundaries yeah. in a way that a lot of other writers didn't. I think it may have to do with the fact that, um, well, maybe I'm wrong, but something about the fact that they are, they have to work so hard to make their space for themselves yeah. that, that it makes, I 
I imagine it makes you more time. You must be really driven by your work in order to actually do that. You know, like there, I'm sure there were other authors who were very good and could write, but um, you're sort of like you, by being somewhat isolated within yourself, I, I expect you, um, you're already going against the, the, the stream by trying to publish as a woman at the time. Yeah. And then, so why do you care what the stream is saying about what you can and can't do? No. Does that make sense at all? Uh, it does make sense. And also um, there were periods when she really couldn't publish, uh, when she was having difficulty publishing and she just kept writing. So I think part of it is, I'm just guessing, but I think part of it is that some people just need to write. They're just full of stories. And she strikes me as someone who is full of stories. Um, there's a way in which some writers are sort of externally driven in that they have specific ideas that they want to get across. Um, and Le Guin was like this. She, she um, had... Um, she was engaging with certain ideas. She was trying to say certain things. And I actually don't get that sense from Tanith Lee. I get the sense that she's more like a poet mm -hmm. in that there were stories that were sort of in there. Um, and the it, it's the primary thing is the story. It's the story getting out. It's, it's less of an engagement with some sort of external idea or philosophical um, I think it, she was more vis viscerally, um, she's more visceral in her writing, I'd say, mm -hmm. and heightened emotion. Um, yeah. it, it all comes out in a way that I think makes it ties to what you're saying, honestly, um, which is that it's coming from a different place. It's coming from sort of a, a, a non -anal, um, maybe even to a certain extent subconscious where you're not really sure what you're doing. There's there's some story I looked at a review recently. I I found there's someone who's reviewing you know, older works on YouTube, and he was reviewing the Electric Forest, which I like, and I was curious what he would say. And he was said, you know, and then it got a little confusing toward the end, and kind of, you know, I couldn't, I wasn't sure. It, it seemed kind of surreal, and I'm like, yeah, I bet that's just how she felt about what it should do. You know, like yeah. it wasn't about blocking the story as much as giving you this certain experience as you move through it. And she also does that through language, right? Yes, Because absolutely. her language is so rich. Um, and I think, honestly, that was what, one of the things that really attracted me to her stories right from the beginning, that her language was dark, rich, poetic. Was It's sort of like a big, beautiful chocolate cake right? Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, there's stories in there. And actually, now that I think about it, I hadn't thought of, of it before, but I bet Catherine Valente has also been influenced by her because there are stories within stories. And so the other thread that's coming through her is The Thousand and One Nights. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, and absolutely. so um there, there are always narratives within narratives. There are different people telling stories and the story is different from different perspectives. Um, and she's, it, it, especially in her fairy tales, she's switching the perspectives. Like if someone else tells the story, then it's good. If, if the Wicked Stuff- I Mother love that. Story, it's yeah. going to be different. Um, yeah, and and I see that in Catherine Valente too, that, that sort of emphasis on style, the dark romanticism, especially in some of her earlier things. So um, I, you've reminded me that she did that whole choosing another perspective. Um, thing it does is it allows you to um, rewrite the narrative and her fairy tales are explicitly feminist. You have your own extensive catalog. You have stories, novels, short stories. Stories and short stories, poems. I mean, you do a lot and you're also an academic. Oh. Um, what drives you, you know? Um, so the stories, maybe it's the same thing that drove her. I don't know. The stories come and then they're in here. 
And then either they come out or they don't come out. And if they don't come out, they stay in here and they drive me a little bonkers. Um, but um, they, they, I keep getting story ideas after, uh, there, there are people who sort of search for story ideas. They come to me literally all the time. I was reading a book last night and I absolutely love the plot by um, uh, Rosemary Stewart, I think. Um, <laughs> And uh, I love the plot and I thought, oh, if I just shift stuff around, then I'd have this whole new plot and I could do this whole thing. And I thought, nope, go away, go away story. Just stay, put, put, <laughs> I'm gonna put you in the story box. I want you to stay here. Um, mm -hmm. But um, there are times when I've had story ideas. I had one story idea and I didn't have time to write it. And then by the time I had time to write it, I had another story idea. So I just put them together. And it, you oh, know, I love that. Did that some, yeah. right? She had so many. Her books are dense, dense with story. That's one thing. And maybe that's partly why you see something like something that looks like fantasy and then it turns out to be science fiction or science fiction and then it's melded with fairy tale. Um, because there were so many stories in her head. I don't know, but um, that's how it happens with me. I have story ideas come and they start bothering me. And I have too many of them, which is too many of them for the time I have, which is the real problem. I'm trying to carve out more of a space and they come in a lot of different ways. I have novel length ideas and short story length ideas and I have poem ideas that- Do a they lot feel distinctive to you, those ideas? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's they do. They have a shape and a, a length and sometimes they, change mm -hmm. um, but especially poetry I mean I write poetry while writing on the metro because um, sometimes sounds lovely. I the time and I have and I sit there and I go okay I have an idea I'll just jot it down do you and think there's an energy behind it that if you don't get it out it's going to turn inward a little bit is that something you experience I mean just from my own experience that that I mean I'm not nearly as prolific as you but it's an energy thing. If I don't get it out, it starts to eat. Yeah, my brain gets too, my brain gets too cluttered. I have too much stuff going on. And I also feel bad because there was a story and it didn't get told. And oh, so, and yeah. there, there are some things that are from when I was starting out. Um, and I've sort of let them go like, oh, you were really nice, but I wasn't ready to write you at the time. And I can't really write you now. I don't know how I would write you now. So, but but then often I take stuff that I thought of a long time ago and then they become parts of new stories. Um, and sometimes I just tell them, you know, just stay there for a little while because the rest of the story will come. So that all makes sense to me. And it all seems very much, I think you're right. It's very much, I think, how I would guess Tanith was too, actually. Um, just brimming. And if you're brimming, it, I hope you do carve out the time. I really do. Thank you. That's the hardest thing, right? Um, and I was reading actually a little bit about her life and how it took until she could make enough money from her writing for her to be able to quit her job. Um, and we're in a different world now. I don't know who makes enough. Very few people make enough yeah. money from writing. You really have to be quite successful. Um, you, you cannot make, well, no, it, it's a different situation. We we make about as much money from writing short fiction as they did back then, but the prices have skyrocketed, right? You used to be able to actually make a living writing short fiction once upon a Would time. You, see, that would have been my dream because honestly, for me, even like you, I didn't tell you at the time, but as a teen, I was really drawn to short fiction. I mean, I, I still have other collections by other people. And I'm like, that is my first love, but it's not, it's not ever. ever. Yeah, in yeah. the days of Fitzgerald and Hemingway, they could make decent money writing short fiction for magazines. Um, and right. even the genre writers, they were writing a lot. They were pretty prolific, but there were writers who were just churning out stuff um for magazines you know we don't we don't live in that world um, she doesn't, you know, I hope trying to be silver lining about it it maybe just means it forces us to ex expand 
further than we might have otherwise done. Yeah. Um, and we maybe a few more, we have to, I don't know, um, be more flexible, I think. Yeah. It's very okay. innovative. I'm going to ask you one more question. Um, is there anything you'd like to share about upcoming projects? Well, um, so, um, Yes. So I will have a short story collection coming out, a new one. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure yet uh, when, and I'm not sure yet what the title will be. So I will let everyone know when I know. Um, and I'm working on some longer term projects. We were talking a while ago about um, how my life has been really crazy recently because I've been doing a lot of international travel, but there are two uh, pro longer projects that I'm working on. One is I had a short story actually called Pip and the Fairies uh, quite some time ago. And when I wrote that short story, I realized that there was in fact a novel in it. So I'm writing a novel version of what was originally a short story. Oh, that sounds, I'm, that sounds, in, in, I'm really interested. Yeah, it's about a um, little girl whose mother wrote children's books about how her daughter Pip met fairies, and now she's all grown up and she can't remember whether the fairies were real or not. And her mother has recently died, so she's going back. I love that premise. I really do. Past and trying to figure out, you know, were these fairies real? Um, the other one is actually a. Uh, I'm not quite sure what it's going to be yet, but um, it is a book that focuses on my grandparents' apartment in Budapest, which is one of the reasons that I've been in Budapest. Um, and it is the apartment itself um, was a place where I found some of this out recently. Um, it um, was uh, a place from which from its windows, my grandpa, uh, sorry, my grandparents, but also my my mom um, watched the uh, 1956 revolution kind of taking place. There were Soviet tanks coming down the street and the yeah. little girls, she and her sister were watching from the windows. So I kind of started from that. And recently we found out that um, the, uh, the apartment was actually a safe house for Jewish refugees during World War II. And so yeah. I'm really interested in exploring the way that this one location, this one building, which was built in late 1800s, that it watched kind of history um, happen right around that area. It, it lasted through two world wars and through the communist era. And so it's a very different kind of project for me, but actually it's not so different. I don't know, for me, somehow fantasy is sort of interwoven with everyday life. It always has been. No, that makes complete sense to me. I could have, you talked about having to just, and then we'll stop about the renovation of that apartment and I taking it down to the wall, so to speak. And it sort of, I, I begin to imagine about what sort of, what is, emotionally comes out of those walls as everything is taken back it just immediately of course it's all the same oh just so interesting yeah and it's in budapest and there is something it, this is this is the immigrant experience that there is something fundamentally fantastical about the american immigrant experience that you come from someplace and you know we were talking about your grandparents right yeah. Well, you're coming from someplace and that place is um, for many people, it's inaccessible or it's hard to access and it's got a different language. It could be Elvish. It could, it's got yeah. this magical food. Um, oh, it is it's a place so... that is lost to us. And so basically that's <laughs> the, story, the secondary world fantasy. It's so interesting. I have a short story coming out soon that is toward, sort of is talking about these very, very things. Uh, it's it's really un uncanny, actually. Um, we'll talk Good. about it. <laughs> Excellent. I'm glad. Um, I'm going to uh, end the interview, though, for, and say thank you so much for joining me and for sharing all that you've shared um, about you, your process. And I cannot wait to see what you come up with for this anthology. 